What's going on everybody? How you doing? In today's video we are doing a PayPal request video. This video has three people that have requested it. That's Lucinda and Ray and Jesse all asked for the same video. I, it should really be two different separate requests because Lucinda and Ray came in as the same person. So anyways, they're related or something. Anyways, thank you to everybody. In 1992, Neil Peart did a drum clinic in Irvine, California. That's what we're checking out. <laughs> this is a really long video, so I cut it up into five parts because I don't, I'm not crazy about doing ultra long videos. I don't, I'm not crazy about it. So I'm like 20 minutes is plenty, you know, like I'd rather people watch, you know, like, and we just do parts, just break it up into 15 minute sections or whatever. And there's enough time for me to do the rest of the things that I got to do talking and all that kind of thing like this. So uh, that's what we're doing. Five parts. This is going to be very interesting because Neil is talking about, he plays a bunch of songs. He's talking about triggers. I know this just from what uh, Lucinda Ray and Jesse were telling me. So very cool, very cool request. Very interesting. This will be super interesting. And I was informed that it was filmed on a potato. This is 1992. So expect that type of quality. If you're new here, please subscribe. Check out my videos, all kinds of videos, reaction videos, bass videos, music videos, all kinds of videos. Check it out. If you like the channel, if you want to support the channel, all kinds of ways, you can hit super thanks underneath this video. You can hit me direct in the description. I got PayPal, Venmo, Amazon wishlist, mailing address. Amazing. And now doing request videos. If there's a song, or a video you want me to watch, if you want me to react to something, if there's a, a topic, a subject that you want me to talk about, if you have a question, any of that kind of thing, hit me direct, PayPal or Venmo, and in the notes, let me know what your question is, what the video is, what you want me to make a video on, if there's a link, a description, and I'll make a video like this. Awesome, okay, so this is part one, Neil Peart, Clinic, 1992, Irvine, California, part one. Let's do this band. Everybody, welcome to the workstation. Uh, we did this a couple years ago at the LA Forum. And oh, yeah. Things. I thought it would be nice to have Definitely. everybody uh, at the table up close and I could sort of demonstrate what goes into the performance and what all the little clothes are made out of, how the drum kits evolved even uh, since that time. Basic changes I made. Uh, this time we went into uh, start the Rolling Bones record. I decided that maybe I was taking it a bit safe and I wanted to change a few things around. So as Larry was setting stuff up, I said, hey, wait a minute, let's, let's move some stuff around. So uh, I put all the toms in different places and moved my floor thumb over onto the left side. And so then if I did go to any, to any of my safe usual patterns, at least they would sound different. And also it gave me a lot of different uh, rhythmic variations of having a low note under the left hand and different pitches available in different physical areas. As we go through the songs, what I've done, I just took a live tape from the other night in Reno, and I'm going to pump it through the monitors and play along with it and uh, kind of explain what, what each song is made of, both musically and technologically, and kind of what I'm having to deal with out here in terms of challenge. And one of the first ones is a song called Time Stand Still from a few years ago. And this one, I'm having to work through a click track because of the female vocalist on it, Amy Mann. And uh, obviously, she's not free to travel with us all the time, so we had her up on the screen. And in order to keep the song in sync, so that when she comes up there singing, she's actually singing to the audience as well. I'm playing with the click tack to that. And then, uh, apart from the uh, acoustic stuff, I've got a, kind of an array of samples, which is, uh, yeah, just, just work. This little sit here is a handy little trigger that uh, we invented and had made. It's like a miniature Simmons pad. It gives me access to an electronic trigger right in the middle of things instead of all the electronic pads are, pads are mostly difficult to get to. And sometimes if you're having to stretch too far, we can put you off your, uh, your tempo and smooth so for some things to keep them. Like this combination, I have a little block down there, and then a sheet of metal up there, and uh, different parts of the middle. Castanets over there. A weirded out snare. And then we're also, just to, um, of course, being a three piece, we use a lot of keyboards and a lot of stuff on uh, our records that's difficult to reproduce. Well, the other guys are so busy with foot pedals and choreographing all their moves cool. 
because one of our points about sampling is that nothing ha nothing can come from off stage. Anything that gets triggered is triggered by us in real time, so that we're the ones that have to get it in time. And I have to set up the tempo sometimes. Two minutes into a song, a sequencer will come in, the sequencer in perfect tempo. So I'm responsible really to keep the song together right up till that level. So when that sequencer comes in, the song suddenly doesn't go right. or slow right. right down. So that's an extra special challenge in the show too, is that when I'm not playing to a click, there still are those constraints that at a certain point in the song, suddenly this bit of perfect tempo is going to come in and I'd better be ready for it, you know. And, and again, from the other guys too, whoever triggers that thing has to trigger it at exactly the right time so that it doesn't upset the tempo and the flow of the song. So there's one part in this song where I'm wired into Getty's keyboard set up and this little DAWs pad here, that's its function. It's, it's the voice of the keyboards. So in places where I can help them out and I can see they're having trouble juggling it all, I say, give me that part, I can play that. Mm. And uh, in this part we have a part, um, we call it Event City, and basically it's all, uh, it's a series of sound effects that were put together over the course of a day in a studio. It's not even playable live, and you'll hear it as it goes through the song. That it's another thing that I have to play it exactly in the right time, stay in time with it through a 7-4 seven, uh, seven section, and then come out of it on time, still in time with the click track of the film and all that. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on that's uh, only driving my mind crazy and hopefully just keeping the song together. So we'll get going with that one. And he's got his bike helmet. It's like barely fits his head.
really want him to go through. Because I'm like, you hit something over there. I don't know what it did. I have no clue. Yeah. What is that doing? I freaking love drums. I'm not a drummer at all, but they're just great. Drummer's the most important person in the band. I've said it before. Nice. Cool. Okay, what are you hitting? That's just an example of all the variables you have to deal with in a song that, uh, Say most of our songs are free from click or anything. We have two where other people's voices are involved, so we stay in sync with it. But through all that, other people are, are triggering sequencers through there, and the one I mentioned from the keyboards. If I don't nail that on time through that seven section, then you know the train wreck happens. We had a couple times on this tour uh, oh. when I, it has to happen to everybody, and I know it does. Even even Buddy Rich, I know it happened to that the whole band just. This, the guys out on the soundboard will be making this. Here comes the train. <laughs> so there are infinite opportunities. It's one of the things that does make the show uh, such a case of stress. And before it comes up, it's like what's in your mind is all the things that can go wrong mm. and uh, all the things, too, that are outside of your control because there's so much of it is technology. And even mechanical things, if a snare head breaks at the wrong time, mm. it can be you know, an absolute nightmare. Uh, next one I was going to go on to is one called Bravado from the new album. It's interesting, I think, because it's, it's basically fundament, um, founded upon a, a four on the floor bass drum rhythm, which is one thing like I think a lot of drummers, I used to be leery of, you know, I used to think I'm not gonna sit there and play a four on the floor bass drum beat for all day. And uh, especially in the 70s when it was sort of uh, mm. symptomatic of disco, it was like, it was poison even by association. But over the years I have found interesting ways to apply it. And the thing that it does do beautifully is that it roots a rhythm and allows your hands to go all kinds of different places. And this song, I spent a lot of time refining down a drum part that I think is almost architectural. It supports the song in different ways. Dynamics come in and out of it. It gave me a great opportunity to use having a floor tom on my left, as you'll see both rhythmically and as a, a jumping off point for fills. And it's another one too in which uh, sequencers come in and out in perfect time. So it's another one where I have to nail the tempo from the beginning and parts of the, the sequencers go away for minutes at a time and then suddenly they're back in. So I have to keep the song rooted through the whole space of it and then at the end of it there's an entire uh, improvised section that we added to the recorded version uh, in the rehearsal room and we decided at, after all these years we've learned how to reproduce our records live which for a long time was a goal and we've taken criticism for it but I, I think it was a noble thing to try to reproduce what is actually a superhuman performance in the studio. You can make it perfect, you can correct all your mistakes. If there's a little bit you don't like, you can go out and fix that little bit. You know, it, it is truly and literally superhuman. So uh, we pursued for probably 16 years just that goal of trying to be as good live as we were on record. And we felt that we'd more or less achieved that to our satisfaction, so this tour we immediately started changing our goals. And uh, even the new songs, we right from day one of rehearsals, we started changing arrangements we have to drown this guy out. We started right. changing arrangements, adding improvised bits and so on. And uh, this song's an example like, of that, where the whole end part uh, evolved out of uh, rehearsal room rehearsals, or rehearsal room jams, basically. But then we found out when we came into a venue like this, suddenly the intimacy, both personally and musically among us, was kind of lost. And in arena particularly, it was awfully difficult for us to feel truly free uh, in an improv improvisational sense, so we found that all these patterns and ideas that we developed in the rehearsal room served as well as a foundation, but the chances I would take in the rehearsal room obviously are much greater than the ones I would take in, in front of an audience. And I think um, that's a safe enough bet. In fact, I had an interesting conversation about that with Mickey Hart. I went to my first Grateful Dead show in, in Atlanta early in this tour, mm. and uh, he was telling me, he said, the last night they'd had an absolutely great show, and, and that night's one he felt was pretty boring, because their show was so much predicated on improvisation mm -hmm. as is so much jazz that as as human 
nature and human behavior is, it, it has to range from the ridiculous to the sublime. Some nights it's going to be brilliant, like any of us, and other nights it's going to be really lousy, like any of us. So uh, that's, that's also the weakness of improvisation, so it's a reason why we like to keep our show well balanced in favor of organization, so it will always be at least good. And if we're having an extra special night, there is room, and there are jumping off mm. points where each of us, and collectively, we can now take it further if it's happening. But uh, I thought it was interesting for Mickey to admit that, that you know, some nights yeah. they had a brilliant night, and other nights he felt you know, and admitted that uh, it was pretty lame. Go on with the uh, bravado. Cool. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, I thought that was very cool. And I liked all that end talk, uh, talking to Mickey Hart, all that. That was because he's right what he's talking about. It's, it's definitely accurate. That just makes it all the more incredible, you know, in terms of like jazz artists that are just that good where so many of the nights are fire you know a lot of that improvisation without that kind of music and just without music that's improvised you know you lose that and i i consider myself an improvising musician i could play parts i could do all that kind of thing that's fine but like i improvise i like to improvise i like to not play the same thing i like to add in different things i like to you know, if there's like a bass part or whatever, I like to improvise within that. Improvise within the song. Okay, here's your boundaries. Improvise within this. It's not just A to B. How else can I get from A to B? How else can I get from A to B? What's another way that I can get from A to B? Every night, right? Really cool. But it's accurate. Some nights, you just, it's just not there. And other nights, it's like, man, I'm on fire right now or I, it's just flowing, all of it is really cool. Uh, what else did I want to bring up about this video that I thought was really cool? I wish he'd talked about, maybe he'll, he'll do that eventually in one of the other parts where he's talk, where he'll talk about like some of the things that he's hitting. Cause I'm like, you're hitting some kind of pad to his left and I don't know what it's triggering. I couldn't tell. I don't know if that's because it's on a potato or what, or what. Oh yeah, he talked about um, this next song which is coming up in the next video in the in part two, bravado, which I've not heard yet. That's on uh, uh, Roll the Bones, he said, right? I'm not there yet. But he said it's founded on a four on the floor rhythm, which I'm like, you played four on the floor in, in Time Stand Still. <laughs> Under that whole part, he's playing four on the floor. He's It kicks going four on the floor that whole time. It's just downbeats, right? That whole section. And then it breaks once, uh, uh, you know, experience slips away, all that kind of thing. See, I know some of the lyrics. Wow, incredible. People. <laughs> People telling me about lyrics. Okay, let me just do my thing, all right, guys? Jeez. Anyways, yes, I know the lyrics. I know enough of the lyrics, all right? <laughs> I don't even like that album. Jesus, come on. Any, no credit. I'm just, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm going too far. Anyways, really cool. Again, I'm not a drummer. When I said bury the kick, that's that's like drummer talk, right? I, you know, again, not a drummer. But uh, what I mean is that he's, at least how I understand it means, is that he's hitting the kick and he's leaving his foot down. He's burying the beater in the kick until he hits the next note. He's not like hitting it and then getting off so that the beater comes off in between notes. He's hitting it and it's staying, the beater is staying on the drum head. From what I know, that's called burying the kick. Anyways, I didn't mean audio-wise burying the kick or like he's drowning out the kick volume or something, something like that. That's what I meant. Anyways, amazing, very cool, very interesting. And uh, yeah, let's get on to part two. Thanks for watching, I'll catch you on later.